So welcome everybody uh, back to another webinar organized by Princeton University's uh, Bentham Center for Finance. So we're very happy to have uh, Bob Schiller with us. Hi, Bob. Hi. Bob is uh, talking to the, today about narrative economics and the COVID crisis. So he has also written a book on narrative economics and we will learn more about these aspects. As usual, I want to go back what we did in the previous webinar and what we did, uh, what we will do next week. So last Monday, Mike Spence was talking about tracking the global pandemic economy. Today, Bob Schiller will talk about narrative economics and it's also related to an earlier webinar we had by Tyler Cohen, who was also talking about uh, narratives and other aspects and momentums and so forth and trends, which are speeded up by the COVID crisis. Next uh, week, we have Arminio Fraga talking about uh, the Brazil's perfect storm. Arminio was very influential in bringing inflation down in Brazil many uh, two decades ago. Now, and is very influential uh, intellectual in Brazil and is very well familiar with the Brazilian situation. Then the next Friday, we will, Richard Zeckhauser will talk about climate policy moving beyond the ostriches and the palianas. And we will learn you know, how climate policy, what are the challenges there and what we should avoid uh, on that dimension. Now, let me start with narrative. So my short introduction, what is a narrative? And typically a narrative is some simplified consistent story connecting various events. And it's much more persuasive if you use a narrative rather than, you know, some other ways of communicating to exchange ideas and stories. And, um, What's most pervasive often is a simplified story and simple stories are very challenging in a world which becomes increasingly more and more complex. So what we learn from day to day is becoming increasingly more complex and the power is actually in simple stories and the model itself, we use a lot of economic models, is also a simplified picture of reality. And when we use the simplified picture of reality, we have implanted some people into this model and these people live in this simple model and then they typically in economics assume the people are fully rational because the model is so simple it's just a simple picture of reality and it appears if we go depart from full rationality of this model of these people in these models it seems a little stretched but we always have to keep in mind that actually the model itself is already a simplified picture of reality and there's a whole shift away from the rational paradigm to a behavioral psychological paradigm in economics. And Bob was very, very influential in, in essentially nudging this whole shift into this behavioral paradigm and is still very much at the forefront of this research agenda. Now, once you build simplified stories and models, the question is how consistent is it with uh, internally? Is the model fully rational? and it comprises a well model, which is solved in all uh, full rationale. Nobody makes mistakes in that. And that's internal, consist uh, uh, ex uh, internal consistency of the model itself. And then there's an external consistency concept that how much does the model depict reality or is it distorting reality to make the model simpler? And of course, like a map, uh, you know, if you were to put everything into a, on a map, it would be very useless. So you have to abstract away from certain dimensions to make the model simpler. But of course, you lose something on external validity or consistency with reality. So it's always a trade-off how much you want to simplify things. Then you can actually do more internally inside the model. But um, if you abstract away too much, you lose all some important dimensions from reality. But in a world where things get always more and more complex, we have to, you know, have a trade-off. You can, on the one hand, there's a tendency, you know, to oversimplify. You want to avoid oversimplification to ignore some first order effects. On the other hand, you want to include all the aspects which are important. So it's, that's always the trade-off you're facing. And the question is also, how would you measure complexity if a model is more and more complex? One way to measure complexity is the layers of reasonings or layers of thinkings. And that's, you know, I've written some work on this with Martin Oemke and with um, Sanjeev Arora and other computer scientists because in complexity in computer science is a big deal as well. And there are certain concepts which economics can borrow from computer science. Now, 
so stories are very powerful and stories uh, in the public sphere lead to an exchange and con convincing others and persuading others. And so the interaction of ideas, interaction of stories and narratives is very, very important. And that reminds us, of course, of uh, Jürgen Habermas, one of the important philosophers of the 20th century, which, you know, had his public spheres where we, we argued that starting in the early 18th century, uh, 19th century, so in 1800s, uh, in coffee houses and clubs and journals evolved and the exchange of ideas of simple stories and narratives was very, very important for an open society, for a democracy. And of course, it also raised the questions whether we live in a common public sphere or a divided public sphere. So everybody lives his own little bubble and there will be echo chambers in it. And that's where also behavioral elements come in back. And again, they have cognitive dissonance. If you always hear from your own echo chamber, the same message over and over again, you believe it more and more, even though it's just a repetition of earlier uh, messages and group things and other aspects uh, will come into play. And that causes immediately a link to COVID, to the COVID crisis, where the COVID crisis is uh, full of conspiracy theories and hoax stories in, on the internet and social media. And they are very, very much alive. And the question is, you know, how to deal with these uh, conspiracy theories. And that's a, it's an open question. I hope that uh, Bob will also shed some light on that. But in general, if you think about which bubble you live in, what's your public sphere, how big is your public sphere you're interacting with, a common language is always very, very crucial. And that divides the public debate along national boundaries. And one clear example of that was the Euro crisis, where there was a battle of economic ideas between different economic philosophies. On the one hand, the French philosophy, on the other hand, uh, the German philosophy, where the economic thinking is quite different. And it's often referred to as the Rhine divide, where the river Rhine is actually dividing France and Germany. And the way to approach how to solve a crisis is very, very different. That's what I've outlined in the book with Jean-Pierre Landau and Harold James. So essentially the intellectual debate is, is held within each country because of different languages. And to the extent it was done across the borders, across the River Rhine, it was actually done through international media in a, in a third lang language uh, in English. But that of course excludes you know, many people who don't really who communicate too much in, in a third language. But in general, any interest and incentives, you have to interpret through the lens of ideas. And if the ideas are different because you live in a different uh, bubble in a sense, uh, then uh, you, know, you come to different interests and you push to different things. It's very hard to have a, a currency union or a common area to push for the same thing. So that leads me to social media and sharing narratives and stories. And it might, we might move from a world where we had more national boundaries to more digital boundaries. So we divide the countries not based on language areas anymore, we become much more globalized, but we divide it based on digital areas, uh, whereas age groups, sociological groups and so forth, or digital you know, currency areas, which is also along certain platforms, digital platforms. And so that's another way to see how the world is moving. You divide the world not based on national boundaries anymore, but much more based on digital boundaries, depending which platform you're on, whether you're on TikTok or you're on based on Instagram or Facebook and so forth. And that, of course, it gives attention how to regulate the social media. The law is national, but the public spheres will be divided in different boundaries on based, for example, on age groups and others. That makes it very, very, ten there's a lot of tension there. And there will be fight for control across nations, who is controlling the social media companies and so forth. But the key essentially is to have a more exclu inclusive public sphere across digital areas and or virtual territories or bubbles, the, whatever you want to call them, to share the narratives across, to don't have these subgroups and echo chambers. And that will be the key to develop our narratives and build these bridges. And that's the role of public intellectuals and popular science and so forth to reach to a broader community. And that's also where Bob is very active and plays an important role as well. Now, moving on to another form of bubbles like asset bubbles, where Bob has done important work uh, as well. His famous book on irrational exuberance on the third edition is probably one of the most sold uh, economic books. And 
But the question on how narratives spread and persuade others and how they move along across groups is you can measure also with asset bubbles. So when, you know, the news and the narrative, we have a new market, like for the internet boom, uh, we have a new economy. When the lift boy starts buying shares, so when it all the way goes to the lift boys, then it is actually the case when typically we have some speculative bubbles going on and so forth. And there's some extra, typically you can have models. You might be rational for the, the many guys to write the bubble then if others have extrapolative expectations. So that's the extrapolative expectations then drive up the prices. And then it is the case that even the rational guys, knowing that others have extrapolative expectations, who don't want to attack the bubble and rather ride the bubble. And that leads, of course, often to huge mispricings, which we have seen in many, many bubble episodes. But again, it also shows how the narrative spreads across um, many parts of the population. And that actually is interesting to measure with, uh, with uh, asset bubbles as well. So as usual, let me conclude with a poll question. And uh, we have three questions today. The first one is, do we think that the persuasive powers of simple stories or narratives is typically underestimated, correctly evaluated, or overestimated? So what's your opinion on that? The second question is, is the global society split across not national boundaries, but actually digital communities or bubbles, whatever you want to call them? Or do you think the national forces are still powerful and, but or do you think class forces are still very powerful? So which one or do you think are the most uh, relevant uh, communities these days? And the third question is uh, narrative ec economics. So in economics and narratives, it can be understood within the rational paradigm, do you think? So we don't have to deviate from the rational uh, homo economicus, or do we have to go to more uh, to behavioral psychological elements in our models in order to understand uh, narratives, the role of narratives in economics. So I give you a, a few more seconds to for the votes to come in. Okay, so let's uh, get up to 80% of the votes. Okay, I'm closing now. So the, the results essentially is that the power of persuasion of simple stories is typically underestimated. That's what 74% think. So a huge majority thinks that they underestimate this. And so we will learn today from Bob more about it. 14% it's correctly evaluated and 12% think it's overestimated. In terms of the global society is a split mostly based on national, not national boundaries, but more digital communities. It's only 19%. 55% think the national forces and the national boundaries are still more, the most powerful ones. And always classes across classes is the most powerful. That's 27% think that. And whether narratives in economics can be done within a rational paradigm, 19% think, but 81% think we need some behavioral elements for that. So with these results, I will uh, close my opening remarks and uh, pass on the floor or the screen to Bob Schiller. We're looking forward uh, to his insights. I hope I can start my presentation. Is that uh... so? Anyway, uh, uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I think that uh, the people voted in your poll. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. The people voted on your poll, uh, just as I would have voted. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, I think uh, the idea of uh, narratives is uh, is uh, well established already, uh, and uh, uh, its role in economics, however, is is still small, uh, and that's uh, why I wrote the, write, wrote the book. Uh, it's just not our thing to talk about narratives. So you said some interesting things about uh, social media redefining our national borders. Uh, and I think uh, that's, that's provocative. Uh, it's not what I'm emphasizing here. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I've, uh, some of you might remember I gave a, uh, a presidential address at the American Economic Association. 
uh, in uh, 19, I'm sorry, in 2017. Uh, and I've been uh, about narrative economics. Uh, and uh, this presentation has a few slides in common with that lecture, but it's mostly new. I've been thinking about narrative economics uh, quite a bit uh, over the last three years. Uh, so maybe the next slide is my book cover. Uh, and I, I'm showing this because what you see here illustrated in the book cover is the epidemic curve, which is so much talked about now in just the last few months because of the COVID-19. Yeah, that's the curve. Uh, and my thought is that the, uh, the world we live in, the social world we live in, including the economic world, is very uh, um, much driven by epidemics. Uh, sometimes it's disease epidemic. But more commonly, it's narrative epidemics, stories that change the way people think. Uh, people don't uh, respond mostly, most people don't respond to analytic discussions. Uh, they like stories and uh, human interest stories, especially, especially patriotic stories or stories that involve them in their sense of identity uh, with something good or strong. Uh, but I also like stories that illustrate points. Uh, uh, and we, the human species, it's a human universal. To, language is, of course, a human universal. And language takes place in conversations. Uh, and, uh, and the form it takes is narrative. If you listen to a couple of uh, primitive uh, people uh, talking with, uh, with uh, translated into your language underneath, you'll see that they're mostly, mostly gossiping and talking about other people. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, we save up stories for our next such encounter. This is universal. So I think it's something that matters for economics. The point is that big economic events, that's in the subtitle of the book, are driven by changed stories. Uh, and they're like epidemics. And so now that uh, next slide. Uh, this is from my, my uh, AEA presidential address. It just shows how um, various, how often the word narrative appears in uh, scholarly articles in the fields of anthropology, economics, finance, history, political science, uh, and sociology. In all disciplines, it's increasing. The black lines is all years, the gray lines are 2010 to 2019 we're getting more and more interested in narratives. But the fields least uh, attentive to narratives are finance and economics. They're all growing, but, but some of them not as much as others. I think uh, the thought that I'm entertaining in this book is can it be even more? Uh, have, isn't the essence of, of economic events often a changed narrative? Uh, and we can't miss the essential elements uh, even if it's hard to model, we have to go after it. Uh, so, uh, next slide. Uh, about the volatility of uh, financial markets. This is my, uh, it's an old thing. Uh, from my 1981 American Economic Review paper, updated to 2013 when I gave my Nobel lecture. This is from that. Uh, it just shows the, the real stock market as measured by the S&P Composite Index in the blue line from 1871 to 2013. Uh, since 2013, it's taken off to new record highs. Um, but I, I'm just using the old slide. And the, the, the dashed lines are different, uh, depending on terminal conditions, different uh, embodiments of the present value of dividends with a constant discount rate. And you can see that the, the stock market made huge ups and downs that had nothing to do with something that actually happened. It doesn't it, it automatically prove that they're irrational because the things may have, the, it's a complicated story. What's the alternative to this? But it, the idea that people are, are forecasting the present value of dividends in the stock price just doesn't hold water. So what is it? Uh, next slide. <clears throat> The next slide is uh, from the second edition of my, my book, uh, Irrational Exuberance. I got house prices back to 1890 by splicing together different indices. 
uh, it seemed to me odd that there wasn't more interest. No one had done this before. We created a long time series on home prices. Uh, it's a, a surprising. Uh, I don't know. It, so, but the thing that's, that, that jumps out at you is that there were uh, really only two big boom years uh, in, uh, in boom periods. One in the uh, uh, 1940s up until around 1951. And uh, the other one from, 19, from 1997 to 2006. So what was the essence of those stories, uh, of, of those events? It isn't, you can see building cost, population, or interest rates. Uh, I don't know what variable uh, changed. Those are long-term interest rates. Uh, I don't know what variable changed to drive that up, except something about stories. Uh, for example, in the big boom after 1997, there were a lot of stories about flippers of houses who made a lot of money short, uh, in short time periods. Uh, and uh, after that, it was a speculative bubble in housing that became popularly talked about on the way down. So uh, that's an example of my skepticism about models that, uh, real business cycle models in particular. Uh, next slide. So I looked at those plots and I thought I saw a lot of epidemics. <laughs> the epidemic curve is well known. Uh, and here's an example. The epidemic curve plots uh, the number of newly reported cases or the number of infected people during an epidemic against the uh, time of the epidemic. So here's an outbreak of Ebola. This, this is in my book uh, from um, uh, Weeks, uh, week one of the outbreak to week 21. And you can see that uh, it rose, on, it's a hump shape, like a bell-shaped curve. Uh, it rose and then fell. It rose when the contagion rate was higher than the recovery rate. People started taking precautions. Doctors arrived and they, they, they mitigated the outbreak and eventually came down. Uh, that's the model. It, it happened so many times that it's, it has a name, the epidemic curve. Uh, next slide. So um, uh, we've started to learn the epidemic curve. You know who these people are in this picture, I bet. Uh, they've had um, almost, they've had virtually 100% uh, penetration in American culture and even international culture. Uh, President Trump is such a colorful figure. Uh, we can't stop talking about him. But behind them, you'll see epidemic curves. So even Trump is getting into this. It's become suddenly an epidemic of epidemic curves. And flatten the curve is the, uh, is the idea. Uh, next slide. So uh, I don't see. Yeah, this is the, uh, the New York. This is from uh, the IMHE at Washington. Uh, University of Washington. It shows historically the New York epidemic curve. It's had some smoothing, otherwise it would be a little choppy, up to uh, July 8th. Uh, and uh, you can see it shows a perfect epidemic curve, just as we saw uh, in Ebola. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, this is the uh, a, a example of an epidemic model, the Kermack-McKendrick model, which is almost 100 years old. Uh, mathematical epidemiology has a long history, and they have many, many models. But I wanted to take this as the Ur model. This is the simplest epidemic model. They divide population into uh, susceptibles, infectives, and recovers, S-I-N-R. It's called an S-I-R model. And the key equation is the middle of the three. The, the growth rate of infectives is uh, a constant contagion parameter C times SI, representing the interaction. This assumes a mixing population. So S times I is a, uh, quantifies the number of interactions between a susceptible and an infective, allowing a person to catch the disease. Minus, and then it has minus R times I. Uh, the people get over the disease and they're no longer. R is a recovery parameter. Uh, and that's the model, a simple model, uh, which has been manipulated in so many ways. It's often called a compartmental model. Uh, and so, uh, next slide. The, um, 
it's a three, it's a nonlinear differential equation model. Here's a solution with parameters that I plugged in uh, some time ago, uh, representing uh, estimates for COVID-19. Uh, but I, I, the estimates are all over for, for C and R. C is called the basic reproduction number. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, C over R is called the basic reproduction number. And I've got a C over R of two here. Uh, so you can see that the black line is the, ep is the infectives epidemic curve. And the orange line at the bottom is the new infectives uh, uh, curve, epidemic curve. The, dash, the dotted line is the number of percent of susceptibles, and the dashed line is the percent of recoveries. Not everyone catches it. You notice that the, only 80%, uh, if the contagion rate and recovery rate stay at the parameter values shown above, you'll eventually have 80% of the population infected. If you look at the right side, it's asymptotic to 80%. Uh, so that's where we would be if uh, if there were no uh, if there were no intervention. Interventions can bring the uh, the epidemic way down, and that's what we've seen so far. But the question is whether that's stable. Uh, uh, next slide. This shows uh, the uh, calculating the size of the epidemic. Uh, I won't go through these equations, but there is a formula from the from the original McKendrick uh, Kermack McKendrick model. Next slide that shows uh, C, the, the uh, R infinity, the, the number of people who caught the disease uh, against the basic reproduction number. Uh, so if uh, C over R were two, it shows that uh, uh, it would be about 80% of the population that would be infected ultimately. Uh, uh, and so the flattening the curve comes from this math here. Uh, a lot of other variations on the model show the same thing about an epidemic curve, uh, the size of epidemic curve. Uh, we don't want 80% to be infected. Uh, every country of the world now is still below 10% on COVID-19. Uh, we're getting close to that though in some places. It may be more because we haven't necessarily measured it right. Uh, the next slide. So uh, this is just flattening the curve. Uh, this is from the president's uh, press conference with the task force uh, in March. That's what we're trying to do and hoping that there will be even more progress in vaccines or, or um, uh, a treatment that will uh, lower the... Um... Well, these are deaths curve. There were no deaths in the Kermack McKendrick model, but it's an easy thing to add to the model. and doesn't change its basic uh, elements. Uh, next slide. There's also waves of new epidemics that can occur. Uh, and so in terms of uh, the, Center uh, uh, the Center for Infectious Disease Re Research and Policy at Minnesota uh, has a recent report that shows a number of possible outcomes for, uh, uh, based on various models for COVID-19. Uh, one's got a peaks and valleys, another one is a fall peak. That's this fall, we could have a worse epidemic than we did already. Uh, and there's a slow burn scenario. That's the experience with a lot of diseases. Like uh, some of them are seasonal. So let's just go to the next slide. Uh, this okay. shows the epidemic curve for, uh, well, we just moved ahead. The epidemic curve for Europe and the United States. And it looks like the second wave might be coming in the United States, but not in Europe. And I think that can be modeled with these models in terms of the, how effective our mitigation efforts were to lower the parameter C. And I want to move on to narrative epidemics. And one of them just jumps out as important. I'll stay in the earlier slide for the picture. Okay. Uh, that you, I think every, this has had, this epidemic has had almost 100% uh, penetration of the United States and a substantial penetration in the world. Uh, C over R must be extremely high for this epidemic, the basic reproduction number. Why is it so high? And this is an interesting thing. We're, we're not talking about a disease epidemic. We're talking about a reaction to a video or, or more than one video that passersby made when police were apprehending a man and then killing him on the spot. Uh, uh, people started filming it because they thought it was a transgression. 
they, they, but this thing really went by. There have been other films. So I was just commenting on why the George Floyd video was so successful. And the point mm -hmm. was that narratives are like that. Other narratives that uh, uh, they take over because there's some, something about the camera work or the, the way it involves people and the way it, uh, uh, it, it's a little you know, like any hit, like a hit song. Could you quantify what makes a hit song or a hit novel? Uh, there are people who are trying. It's still hard. There's something about um, human contagion that's uh, hard to describe. Uh, next slide. So um, I just wanted to give some examples of uh, narrative epidemics. This is also from my presidential address. It shows the, uh, I took old models that were popular once so I could see the whole epidemic curve. Uh, the ISL model, the real business cycle model, the overlapping generations model, and the multiplier accelerator model. They all had their time and they all faded away along with the names of their authors. I guess we can go to the next slide uh, of um, uh, uh, the famous economist. Henry George is dominating this slide, the blue line. Uh, he, uh, uh, he, but he too is uh, an epidemic curve and he's fading away. It's not that he was wrong, I guess. I mean, he, he was right for his day. I didn't put Karl Marx on, although that's a good story. But I started to feel uncomfortable because he dominates everybody. So the thing about Karl Marx is that when he died in 1883, he wasn't very, wasn't very well known at all. And the epidemic occurred since then, and he didn't peak until the 1970s. You can have very slow epidemic as well as short, uh, brief epidemic. That's what epidemic theory tells us. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Uh, this uh, is it. The next slide is a slide showing uh, uh, financial panic versus confidence. Uh, actually, it shows uh, various panics: the Panic of 1837, the Panic of 1857, etc. Uh, it's a similar phrase. I searched for them all and found that they all follow epidemic curves. There's nothing before 1850, though. If you know, uh, during the Panic of 1837 and shortly thereafter, they didn't call it that. Actually, there was one more panic that had sort of got in there, Panic of 1825, but it had only about five hits on, mm -hmm. on, uh, back then, so I left it off. It, somehow people got the idea that these are historic events. A bank run is a historic event. And you'll note that the Panic of 1837 for example, the heavy black line, wasn't talked about very much until around the time of the Panic of 1857. And then it went on a big epidemic curve later. Uh, and that's the way these curves go. Uh, there, there, there's a, what I call a constellation of epidemics. Or in epidemiology, they call them co-epidemics. Like AIDS and tuberculosis uh, tend to co, co occur at the same time. Uh, because it's something about the, how they uh, encourage, contain, each of them encourages the other. So I think that's what we live with in the real world of economics. There was no more talk of, uh, well, actually, I could have put on the panic of 1933, uh, but it wasn't much. I think that the language changed and people didn't want to refer to the, 19, they called it the bank holiday in 1933. They didn't want to use this panic word because supposedly the invention of the Federal Reserve had cured pa financial panics uh, of uh, any given year forever. Uh, so th there was a new story that arose after 1907. It was the end of an old story and allowed it to fade away. You can't have a bank run unless people know that there are such things as bank runs. We have new incarnations of the same idea this, uh, just this year with a, a, a toilet paper panic. Uh, mm -hmm. You remember that? Yes. It's the same story, but with a mutated form. Next, uh, next so slide. Bob can ask a quick question. Are these uh, yes. different waves competing with each other or they're supporting each other? It seems like there's a crowding in rather than a crowding out. So if yeah, there's a new panic, the old panics. Okay. Yeah, it can go both ways. Uh, I, I think of mostly the, the term co-epidemic refers to uh, a crowding in where, where the epidemic encourages other epidemics. 
uh, you know, it, you could call COVID-19 an epidemic of pneumonia, I think. Doesn't it uh, bring on uh, pneumonia? Uh, we're not in the habit of doing that. Sometimes we don't see these uh, co-epidemics. So does it matter a lot how the pandemic is called, whether you draw analogies from previous pandemics? Yeah, I think it does. Them? Is it? Uh, I could have, uh, uh, yeah, it's about metaphors. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the, uh, the, the 19th century panics are uh, a lesson or they, they, they concentrate our attention on some idea. The idea of a bank run in the abstract isn't very provocative, but the, you can tell lots of stories about these different panics. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so they're encouraged by the thought that it's a fundamental problem that had to be addressed. Uh, after that, uh, it changed. The, the whole story changed. Uh, and the Great Depression was never named the panic of something or other. Uh, although some people did, a few. Uh, maybe I'll move ahead to the next slide. Okay. During the Great Depression, the, 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 I have two lines here. One is uh, Google Engrams, which is books. Uh, but that ends in 2008, their database ends. And they are, the black line is uh, new, ProQuest News and Newspapers for the expression Great Depression. So this is an interesting pattern. This is a percent of articles, the percent of articles in newspapers and magazines that mention the Great Depression. And you can see that uh, in, um, uh, in the Great Depression, there wasn't much of a, uh, uh, there wasn't much of a, uh, they weren't talking about the Great Depression very much. Uh, and Lionel Robbins wrote a book in 1934 called The Great Depression. He was a great economist, but he didn't get, uh, maybe he started that phrase. But, it, you know, it's like epidemics, they start slowly. Uh, often they do. Uh, and it, 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 because they're growing exponentially from a very small beginning. So Lionel Robbins may have appealed to economists, uh, but, it, but it, it, it put it in the mix and it has grown dramatically ever since. Uh, uh, and this is, a, the, the big spike up is the uh, 2009 financial crisis. Uh, next slide, I'm almost done here. Uh, I think that the Great Depression was more significantly thought of during the Great Depression as, uh, well, uh, one important way of thinking about it was it was a fear of uh, uh, replacement by machines. There, there's a long, slow epidemic with the heavy black line for labor-saving machinery, uh, usually written in concern about their effect on jobs. It starts out in 1811 with the Luddite strikes. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then it peaks around the same time as the Great Depression, but they substituted another name for it, technological unemployment. And people genuinely thought uh, uh, that uh, technological unemployment will, uh, is the real reason for the Great Depression, that machines had gotten so big. There are other names that they had for the Great Depression was the machine age or uh, the power age. That one's even more forgotten. They, 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 were, uh, they thought they lost their jobs to machines. Uh, now, who thought that? I thought since I'm at, speaking at Princeton, next slide, please. I'll include my quote from, um, uh, from uh, Albert Einstein. There is Albert Einstein of Princeton, New Jersey. According to my conviction, it cannot be doubted that the severe economic depression is to be traced back for the most part to internal economic causes. The improvement in the apparatus of production through technical intervention and organization has decreased the need for human labor and thereby caused the elimination of a part of labor from the economic circuit and thereby cause a progressive decrease in the purchasing power of the consumer. So this is Einstein. I, I've never doubted him before. It turns out he was wrong, in a, at least in timing, because the economy bounced right back up after, after, the, after World War II and the Depression. Uh, and so I just have one slide last about uh, an appeal to economists uh, to uh, consider narratives. Uh, I think it's just reality uh, that narratives drive these big events like the Great Depression. People weren't spending because they were worried. 
they were fearful. Uh, and uh, they had various narratives that sustained that feeling. Uh, we have better data now. We have digitized tech. And many of you know this. It's starting to affect uh, all of the social sciences. Uh, I think it can be incorporated into economic theory, ideas about uh, epidemics. I haven't successfully done that. Uh, it's a big project to know how to do that. Uh, and I think we should also start collecting better information. Even though we have all this digitized text, it's not designed for revealing what really popular narratives were. So I, I was just reading a 1958 account by, in a newspaper about the Great Depression. And I thought I saw like five or six cliches, okay? It wasn't a great writer, but they're all, you know, cliches about how low prices were back then and uh, how much we suffered and I couldn't go to college and they're all cliches to me. So, uh, but they change through time. Uh, and a Great Depression narrative and the, the uh, machine narrative now called artificial intelligence are coming back and I think they could become new stories that we have to think about in predicting, making long run forecasts. So I'll stop. Thanks a lot, Bob. So we have a bunch of questions I would like to throw at you. <laughs> the first one is, uh, it is often said that the picture says more than a thousand words and, and right. narratives is all about words and stories. Uh, how do you see, do you see a similar involvement of famous, if you think about famous pictures driving a narrative in a sense or some a way of yeah. thinking about this? Uh, have you thought about yeah, it's, this aspect? It's both speech and, and visual. Uh, I, I quote in my book, uh, the Roman Senator Cicero, mm -hmm. uh, 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 who wrote a book on rhetoric, uh, advice to speakers. And I was quite surprised to find the paragraph in there where he said, I'm quoting him loosely, I may be distorting it a little bit, but he said, try to include visual images in your speech because the, uh, the eye is uh, very important to human thought. And uh, yeah, I, it almost sounded like he was saying it's connected to the brain centers, but he didn't say that. It's just some emotional centers mm -hmm. in the brain. But he said, do it, uh, do include visual images. And often the visual images are, are almost like extraneous detail. It means nothing. Uh, but uh, it actually in, it empowers a narrative uh, that, uh, 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 I guess I was influenced by Thomas Wolfe's book, The Painted Word. Mm -hmm. uh, remember him? Uh, he was a uh, writer on popular culture. And he claimed that if you have trouble understanding abstract art, you're not alone. <laughs> you can't understand it. You have to read the critics. <laughs> it's impossible to know what's good about this without them. Don't blame yourself. So are you, you mentioned some thing which I caught in the beginning uh, that, you know, identities and narratives gives often people an identity. Can you elaborate on that a little bit further? That, you know, that yeah, you want to be uh, part of a group and the group my, is described my, by a narrative? Uh, or my co-author, uh, George Akerlof with Rachel Quentin wrote a book called Identity yeah. Economics. Yeah. Uh, and it's about what matters for, to people, especially after they are, have gone past the risk of starvation or uh, early death. What do they start thinking about? It's who am I uh, and mm -hmm. why am I a good person? Uh, even Adam Smith talked about this. Uh, uh, he uh, talked about what people want. Uh, and uh, uh, he said that children seem to want praise. They, they, they thrive on praise. But as one matures, you realize that praise is often uh, vacuous and you desire praiseworthiness. So you have an image of yourself as a good person. And uh, even criminals, I don't know if he said this, but I'm free, free, even criminals think of themselves as good people, somehow, <laughs> good for somebody. Uh, and that's an, that's an impulse. So a narrative that confirms that uh, is, is going to be popular. Uh, and it it's really speaks to our innermost uh, desires. But it would be interesting to see uh, the competing narratives. You know, normally, it's said in economics, it takes a model to kill a model. No? Yeah, yeah. So it's not the, the natural death rate just over time. It also depends whether somebody else comes up with some better narrative or some better model. 
Is there some research or do you have some analysis? Yeah, and, and uh, then there's a revolution in economics when somebody comes up with a interestingly new model, an <laughs> altogether new model. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, uh, it's, it's difficult. It's like abstract art. You, know, you might not like the model because it just doesn't ring true to you. Uh, but maybe under certain circumstances that you don't appreciate, it's absolutely ringing true. Uh, now, this all seems kind of vague and hard to uh, 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 quantify, but I think that that's where, and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, things that are hard to quantify are challenges. Uh, hmm. But even, you know, economic activity was hard to quantify. We had this revolution in the 1930s and 40s when we came up with gross national product or gross domestic product. Uh, and those things are, um, uh, uh, those models are a little slippery when you get down to it. The aggregation problem is pretty important. Uh, but for a while, I think it gave us some insight. Uh, but I, I really wanted to know what's the outlook right now. And the problem is that I have to uh, rely on forecasts of epidemiology. Uh, I have to forecast the progress of uh, finding a vaccine. Uh, I have to forecast, I have to evaluate uh, 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 fake theories. Did you hear it's just ringing out over the last week? Richard Bartlett, uh, who's a physician in Texas, has argued that he has now got a cure for COVID-19. Do you know this? No. no. Uh, well, I watched his presentation. Uh, he actually says at the end, he says, no need to worry about COVID-19 anymore. I have a cure. Uh, he was being interviewed by some third, uh, fourth rate uh, news show. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and pe some people will believe that. I have to evaluate him. Uh, I started to get suspicious of him when he said that God told me that I had a cure. Uh, okay. A researcher is not supposed to say things. Like, and I had a sense he's part of the evangelical wing. Uh, and, uh, but it could also be just to get attention. No? People want attention. Yeah, I think he wants attention. And he, there's a little epidemic of him. You know, search for him now. He's, he's hot right now. Uh, and I, I hope he has a cure. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Really hope he's right. Um, but I but think in terms of coming back in trying to promote his cure at this level, telling people not to worry anymore. Yeah. Well, this is, you know, to what extent is a narrative, which is a, like a simplified way of summarizing reality, it can be leading to a deeper discussion, but it can also be very misleading in a sense. I know. Yeah. Uh, is it? Is it do our bounded rationality, our incapability to deal with all the phenomena forces us to think in simple stories, I guess, but uh, it can be very misleading. And then we switch radically from one to the next. Um, yeah, I know. So I, I was, I wrote my project syndicate piece here, uh, just on, it came out Monday, about um, what narratives are driving the behavior of the stock market since uh, January of 20. Uh, 20, uh, when the uh, World Health Organization first said it was a, uh, uh, a, a, a emergency of international concern. Mm -hmm. uh, the market kept going up after that, uh, and it reached an all-time high uh, in, um, on February 19th. Uh, why would it go up right now? Now, I'm thinking it, it's, it, there's so many different thoughts you might have as an economist. But I, I, I was looking at the reading what was coming out about it. It still was about China then, uh, mostly. Uh, it, I, I noticed that there was a lot of Google searches for um, uh, coming in later after February 19, just after it, for, for a coronavirus. A lot of people didn't, and pandemic. People mm -hmm. didn't even know what those words meant. And then stories started to appear about hardship in China with the shutdown, with the lockdown. Uh, and then there were stories in uh, March of, uh, and now the market was falling. It fell 34% in, in one month. Now it was more than a month, but um, uh, just 
just a little over uh, um, a month. Uh, and there were horror stories now coming out about uh, in Italy uh, about uh, hospitals having to uh, kind of give a death sentence to some of their patients because they can't handle them all. Uh, and then it became kind of a panic for a while. And then the stories changed again uh, when the market bottomed out March 23. Uh, and this, uh, there were, I think, I, I, I haven't, this is not exhaustive research, but it seems that stories about missing out started to come up and memories of the, the, the two major corrections uh, in 2018 and, and how much you would have missed out if you got out of the market in 2009 after the great financial crisis. So it started to become a fear of missing out narrative. Um, there are other narratives as well. So but how would you how would you measure this missing out narrative? You go to Google and uh, measure the frequency in newspapers. The well, term you can missing search out would come in uh, ProQuest or, or Google or um, uh, other digitized news database, and you can find out what uh, what people uh, uh, what was in the news that they were reading. That's not exactly the same thing as conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I would like new and better databases that could be connected. Uh, you can uh, you can search the I haven't done this exhaustively. Uh, you can search the social media uh, and see what was coming up. Uh, what I'm advocating is a combination of both quantitative and judgmental, bringing together the humanities and the uh, mathematical approach, uh, because you have to evaluate a story, a developing story, uh, and it's hard to do that. Uh, but it isn't, it's also a human thing. So, uh, and then coming to the rescue. And so are you the planning CARES to Act coming to the rescue? Yes. Yes. Are you planning uh, to develop a, a case Schiller type uh, narrative economics index? <laughs> yes, I'm thinking about it. Uh, 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 yeah, so um, like the policy uncertainty uh, uh, index that uh, recently was developed by uh, I forget it. Bloom, Davis, anyway. and Altic. Yeah. By who? The Altic, uh, Bloom, Dark and, uh, and uh, yeah, Bloom. Davis. Yeah, Nick Bloom and co-authors. Uh, so that's based on uh, on text. I think we're going to see a development of of those things. Uh, I I I think that though. We, we need to not be exclusively quantitative because these are slippery stories. You have, sometimes have to use uh, human judgment, uh, maybe human subject evaluating stories for their, uh, for their source of power. I don't know exactly how to do it. It's hard. So there's some uh, questions. We are a social science. <laughs> so we have to be realistic about from, how people think. From the audience concerning who is shaping initially these narratives? To what extent are the policymakers decisive in shaping the narratives, in particular across countries? If you look right. at the US and Brazil, on the one hand, where the narrative is shaped by the, the respective presidents in one direction and in other countries. Yeah. And what news should one follow, whether to avoid fake news? Is there any insights you have on that dimension? So how important are the policymakers uh, these days? And and shaping the narrative, so it comes from any corner of society. Yeah, well, it helps to have someone with a gift uh, for uh, invigorating, uh, th for being quotable. Uh, so like Donald J. Trump, uh, I'm not a supporter of Trump, but he has a gift <laughs> for, for starting narratives. Uh, he's brilliant in some dimensions. I'm thinking back to uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who launched the idea of giving fireside chats during the Great Depression. Uh, you could hear him on the radio. Uh, uh, no president before that had done a regular thing like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and ever since, presidents have, have uh, I don't know about Trump, uh, he's doing even more. He's doing Twitter every day. Uh, so th th sometimes there's a discovery. Other presidents after Roosevelt started the fireside chat. So Roosevelt said famously, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Uh, however, I searched for that quote before him, and I found that uh, Irving Fisher had said approximately that 
mm -hmm. around 1930. And then the, uh, an assistant to the mayor Curley in Boston around 32 had said almost exactly that. You see, you need, you need connection to a celebrity for it to be quotable. You can't, uh, you can't quote this nameless uh, assistant to Mayor Curley, <laughs> who had this great idea. Uh, so I, well, I was also reminded that um, uh, William Jennings Bryan's most famous quote is the only th uh, is uh, you shall not crucify us on a cross of gold. Uh, turns out he stole that as a line from a congressman's speech a couple of months earlier. Uh, and he must have just been struck by it, that that really appeals to my base. <laughs> and so it's remembered to this day. I ask my audiences sometimes, what was the famous line that William Jennings Bryan concluded his 1896 uh, Democratic Convention speech with? And always there is someone who can quote it. This is well over 100 years later. So that, that for some reason, that phrase is colorful. It has a visual image, a cross, a cross of gold. Uh, it ties it into a policy uh, uh, advocacy. He was advocating bimetallism. Uh, so if some people have, uh, it's a poetic impulse in a sense that uh, uh, Trump is very creative, for example, in how he invents names for uh, people, like uh, pencil neck or uh, horse face are names he's chosen. <laughs> <laughs> it's so outrageously ugly, but quotable. You don't forget it. Um, and so that's how things really work. Uh, but does it have to be provocative or it, it's fine? Does it have to be provocative or can it be <clears throat> more scientific? So if you think of Albert Einstein, he termed a lot and was making a lot of statements, but was not necessarily so provocative in a sense. Or. Uh, well, he is an example of a, uh, I, I think he is provocative in some ways. Uh, one thing is his wild hair. Uh, uh, that's what uh, Boris Johnson in the UK has done the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, and well, so did uh, Trump who, who dyed his hair orange. Uh, most people would think that's not right. <laughs> that doesn't look right at all, uh, but it really is provocative. Because, you, you know, it's, men aren't supposed to do these things, according to our culture. And presidents are thought to be uh, um, examples for young people. Not many people have followed, not many men that I know have followed Trump's example. Mm -hmm. It's still provocative. Uh, but uh, I think that is, uh, you know, you have to stand out somehow to be a success in politics. Standing out one way or another, uh, you take a risk that you will be dismissed because of the absurdity of what you're doing. But you sometimes take that risk. So I'm just looking at the question, we're running out of time, but uh, there's some question by Adriano Rampini said, what's the difference between a narrative and an idea or a theory or model? Is, right. is it all the same or is this, are these different nuances or of, this, of a similar thing or very uh, different? Yeah, I, I think of a narrative as a, uh, a telling of the story. If you were to write for the local newspaper and submit your draft, uh, I think you would find the editor sending it back <laughs> and saying, this doesn't communicate to our readers. Why don't you start with a story about some couple who had great troubles and it illustrates your point. Make it a real couple. I, I'll connect you with some if you want. <laughs> that's, that's the difference. But yeah, I, I think that you could identify that you could, if you wanted to have a classification system for narratives, you could, uh, you could classify them by the uh, story that they underlie. So, uh, for example, uh, the uh, Trump narrative is very much focused on people feeling pushed aside that, uh, you know, we had these great jobs locally, uh, some of his supporters, and now I haven't lost my job yet, but Mexicans are, are coming in. Uh, so he tells stories about Mexican immigrants. Uh, and uh, that's the way to communicate with these people. But he doesn't quote statistics about Mexicans. Uh, you know, that's just too abstract. And they probably don't support his story anyway. Uh, it, uh, uh, so you, you could classify them according to their idea. Uh, that's what I want to do, I suppose. 
but it's hard not to tell the story to explain the idea often. Uh, so for example, in my book, I talk about the wage price spiral, which was an epidemic of idea explaining inflation uh, in, in the uh, 1970s, yeah. particularly. So the, the story was labor unions, as exemplified by Jimmy Hoffa in Detroit, are getting corrupt and evil, and they're, uh, they're pushing up the wages of uh, their, uh, their union members, and it's making everything expensive. And then when it gets so expensive, the labor unions ask for even more. There's the spiral. Uh, that, uh, that story can be uh, uh, illustrated by the stories of Jimmy Hoffa. He, he was an outrageous guy, too. <laughs> so uh, he was colorful, but uh, to his base it worked, but to the uh, general population it led to the Reagan revolution and the anti-union sentiment. So how can you, on the one hand, you know, these narratives, you, you can, can be very misleading, no, because you don't discipline it with data and all this. And where do you go from narrative to ideology? So uh, Guillermo Laren asked, you know, what, what's, you know, how would you distinguish ideology and narratives? Or, or well, ideologies involve narratives. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I tell some examples. <laughs> I can't, uh, we, uh, 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 so our American ideology, I, I give an example in my book of George Washington cutting down the cherry tree. And in, 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 this is known universally by almost all Americans. When he was 12 years old, he cut down a cherry tree uh, without telling anybody. And his father was furious. Uh, and so uh, confronted him and George Washington said, you know what he said? No. You're not from the U.S. <laughs> I cannot tell a lie. <laughs> it's just coming out that George Washington lied about his motives for going back to Virginia with his slaves in, when he was president, uh, because it was to ex prevent the, the six-month period uh, when they would be automatically free in Philadelphia. Uh, and he lied. He, he wrote a letter saying, I've got to cover this up. I can't tell them that I'm taking them back to make sure they stay slaves. Uh, oh, okay. So that, that, uh, I think that narrative was part of our ideology. I think it's such a lame story. I, you know, I would have told my father too if I did that. <laughs> I don't think it's so <laughs> remarkable. So, so the next question Wenting Song would like to know, is it the case that the narrative comes always up front and then it gets, goes viral? Or is it sometimes the narrative is invented, exposed to so something is, and then people come up with stories yeah. exposed to, to rationalize it? Uh, can you? Well, the, the invention of narratives is often like a creative writing project. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the narratives are old. Uh, you can, uh, a good idea for creative writing is to go back to old classics that are forgotten today and just say, how can I update this <laughs> so it's new? Uh, and that's the way uh, a lot of good writers think, I, I suppose. They, they, they must do that. Or you read, uh, uh, you get someone to translate a book that was a success in another country and see if you can make it work here. Hmm. And you don't exactly know why you have sort of a gut feeling why this story is succeeding. Uh, but you're never sure, you can't quite put it into words. Good. So let me conclude with, with a final question. We talked about pictures and, uh, and you, of course, you can have written text or you can have voice and or even go to music. So you would say, you know, the waves for music, is it similar to the epidemic waves right. you were illustrated? Right. Uh, or is it, you would say for music, it's different. Uh, Bach is still very popular, even after hundreds of years. Yeah, music is like a uh, story. Well, it, it has, it's a uh, vocal. It has, uh, we have poetry in speech. Uh, and often successful narratives involve uh, some poet. You know, the, the only thing to fear is fear itself. That's kind of poetic. It has repetition. It has rhythm. Uh, and that's what successful uh, speakers instinctively do. Uh, it's, it's sounding like a great speech, uh, uh, and uh, uh, there, there are people who have claimed that we should change the name of our species uh, from Homo sapiens to Homo narrativus, <laughs> or 
or Homo musicus. <laughs> That's been proposed. We are not the only animal. Birds sing. Some of them sing creatively, like nightingales or mockingbirds. Uh, and uh, there's something, uh, there's also birds seem creative, in, at least genetically, in their c colorful plumage. And we think they're beautiful too. We like to hear their singing. Yes. Uh, so there, there is something about beauty in, in nature that is, uh, uh, it's partly in speech, it's partly in sight, and, uh, uh, and, and we are, uh, we are uh, naturally disposed to idolize the eloquent. So we typically stop this webinar series with a positive note, and you can give us some positive narrative you know, about the stock market or inflation oh, forecast or anything. Yes. Uh, it's just some positive narrative to <laughs> say, uh, cheer up uh, everybody. Uh, yeah, when we well, go okay. from this one, well, I have this new idea uh, that I'm thinking about uh, is that GDP is a poor measure of human welfare. Agreed. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, human welfare may take great leaps forward in coming years because we finally become acclimated to Zoom and other such programs to the point where you will allow employees to live far away. Uh, and I think this is, uh, this is a cure for a malady that faces the entire world now, that if you want to be productive, you have to move to another job. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, that means you abandon all of your lifetime friends and family, and you get cut off. We can cure that now. You can stay in your birth home. Uh, you can stay in your little country, wherever it is. Uh, you, you, you don't even have to learn the language. <laughs> <laughs> There's automatic translation. But uh, we might live in the I future totally virtually, you know? You can do you, it virtually. You, you might go, we might live 99% of our lives in the virtual world and only 1% in the real world in yeah. the far future. And it might be very different. Uh, yeah, it might bring uh, real happiness. Uh, uh, our lang I just learned that our English language, the word happiness, uh, doesn't quite translate into Greek. They have the word eudaimonia. So what is happiness to us? It's a, a pleasant feeling that I have. Eudaimonia is, is a little different in ancient Greek. It's a, uh, it's a sense that I'm living well, that this is good. I may not be happy, uh, but uh, this, is, this is eudaimonia. We don't have a word for that in English. Maybe well-being. That, that sounds like not sick. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We might invent new words to describe our new happiness in the future. You can start a narrative with a new word. Uh, that could be your next uh, project. Oh, that's an idea. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bob. It was a pleasure to have you with us. And um, we learned a lot as we about the narrative economics. And I hope this will take off in economics as a subfield, as you have started very much behavioral <laughs> economics uh, with others. Yeah. And um, hope to see you soon in the real world, not only in the virtual world. <laughs> you're virtual behind you, right? That's not that's where correct, you're sitting. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, a, that's a quiz to figure out where it is. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay, thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.